Uh, we know it's not easy to get here sometimes. We want to extend, uh, to extend a special welcome uh, to those who it's their first visit to the island. Just like President Obama, we expect you will be back again yeah, for the first time. And a particular welcome to Ashley Parker and Glenn Rush. You both surely heard of in your vacation. <laughs>
that has brought you this very special evening. You've also seen the exquisite supplement that they did on the book festival, the work of Julia Wells, who's here, Bill Emmel, and their fabulous staff. How lucky are you to live on the community and have such a fabulous newspaper? Trying to find 
uh, betrayal. Uh, and all we had to do is tell the person we agreed completely with her that those bales of hay should not be in front of our house. <laughs> and she got us exactly where we needed to go. Uh, the, student, the, the people here are just spectacular. And I can tell we're not in Washington anymore listening to those opening comments because people so went out of their way to acknowledge the work that other people did. So this is a, this is a wonderful thing. But two people I noticed in the front here that I want to mention. One is Rick Patterson, great novelist and columnist, who was such a large force welcome here, and we were so grateful. And then I love that Deborah Tan, who you have to go here tomorrow, is here because she was, yeah, right, give Deborah a hand. I'm hoping now that Deborah will add to her talk a careful analysis of the nature of the conversation between Glenn uh, and Ashley and how that might be related to gender or the institution that they work for. Either. Love you, Deborah. Um, I, uh, you know, it's not a very interesting time in politics, so you're all here clearly because you know how great uh, Glenn and Ashley are. Uh, and they really are. I, I just have to say, when I was asked to do this, I was pleased and excited that I could be with two really great people. And I'm very biased because Glenn worked with uh, my wife 25 years ago. And um, Ashley was an editor of the high school newspaper, all women high school, where all three of my kids also wrote, including my son who's out front here. Um, and they're both great people. And actually, this is, I don't say this to be flattering, uh, we're really lucky as a Republican, most of us in the journalism business, we're really lucky that they're the kind of people the White House, and I really and truly mean that. And you will see why when I ask my first question. Because my first, I'm going to, since I work for the Washington Post, I don't want to show any bias, so I'll go to the New York Times guy first. I cleared this with uh, them both. Uh, I wrote to both and uh, asked, you know, what do you really want to talk about? And Glenn wrote me a short essay, very short, so I can read the whole thing, that I think is a really useful way to set up our conversation. So I'm going to ask as for a full thing too, which I will get to, but I want to I want to read what Glenn wrote and just ask him to elaborate. Um, and bear in mind as you listen to me, as you listen to Glenn, this guy was played on Saturday Night Live. Uh, which is very cool. But here's what Glenn wrote. He said, I think in general I'd like to focus on the danger of succumbing to the theater aspect of covering this White House and trying to do a basic journalism job in an environment where the president and his staff want to drag you on stage for their own benefit. I think there is a kind of narcissism virus Trump has introduced to Washington, even though I'm sure you will tell me that this is when people make me feel really old, even though I'm sure you will tell me it's been here all along. Uh, the danger for reporters covering Trump, who is the celebrity, is the tendency to view oneself as a celebrity too. So I guess in general, I think a question about the lines between pop culture and populist politics and the actual competent administration of government would be one that I'd be eager to answer. So consider that the question. <laughs> Why do we even need them? <laughs> do your job, man. Is it make this bad? I'm glad you heard that. somewhat popular. Well, no, look, I think is a central component of President Trump's strategy, and prior to that, uh, the Republican strategy on the Hill, it's really evolved, uh, metastasized to some extent, through talk radio, conservative talk radio, um, that the media uh, is their central enemy, um, particularly when there is no, uh, no one has emerged in terms of the the Democratic Party to replace with Hillary Clinton as a target. Donald Trump, uh, there are a lot of factors that led his election, but the fundamental thing we all missed uh, was we thought American politics was fundamentally positive. Um, I will never forget when I started covering uh, the race, uh, looking at his book cover, a crippled America, with a scowl on his face like he uh, had just eaten a, a, a bad shrimp. Uh, and I'm wondering, that, where did the, the message uh, of Morning in America that Reagan had portrayed, uh, that politicians had gotten elected on for, for decades, where had that message come? What we had missed is his base had taken a very 
very negative turn. And anything that smack of, of positivism or optimism was perceived as being false. So what's the flip side of that? The way you win elections is to completely, completely torch your, your opponent. And I think one of the, one of the problems that the Clinton campaign had is that they went along with that. Uh, and I think for the last, I'd say, six weeks of the campaign, they made it much more about a, a negative attack on Donald Trump than an assertion of what she necessarily stood for. Uh, but getting back to the getting back to the question, they need us up there. And when you're in the briefing room, uh, the sense is uh, that they want to have a fight every single day. They want you to step outside of your lane. They want you to join them in terms of uh, spouting vitriol and getting personal in terms of the way that you respond to them. Uh, and more than anything else, they want your fame, celebrity, or now to be derivative of Donald Trump's. And that is a very important thing for us to focus on. Trump is a, is a center of celebrity gravity. Uh, and everyone who works for him, uh, and with the exceptions of what Amici the staff's interesting Kelly, who, who seems to be his own man, but pretty much everyone who has worked for him in a position of authority in the past is someone who is entirely derivative, derivative of him. They're getting fame, they're getting power, and they're getting future fortune. And so, uh, so let me go to Ashley on that same question. And uh, what I'd like to do is ask, what is it like for you to be operating in a circumstance where um, you have the, the newspaper industry in particular doing extraordinary investigative work on this side? And then an administration that at least up to now has leaked like a seat on the other side because they now no longer stab each other in the back, they stab each other in the front. Um, and uh, you know, what is it like to live in the middle of that? And then what is it like, as we do now in a way journalists didn't do 10, 15 years ago, to go on television and be asked to comment on all this while avoiding the appearance of having a political point of view just talk? about your day, and one of the things you, and in your days and your weeks, and how you think this through, and um, also just about, uh, as you put it, um, the uh, horrifying uh, duty rotation at the Washington Post, where every every day, I guess, someone else is in what is called the hot seat. Yeah, so I think um, this is sort of one way that's illustrative of just what covering this administration is like. At the Washington Post, uh, our team is six White House reporters. That's the same as at the Times, the Journal, and Politico. Um, that's pretty standard. And so we have two rotations. One is the traditional interview reporter, which always existed. And it's the person who's in the briefing chair every day, the person who's at the White House, the person who the president travels, travels with him, you know, the person, uh, news of the day, responsible for reaching out for comments, stuff like that. And then we have this other position that seems born entirely to handle what is Donald Trump, and it's called the hot seat. And basically, it's another rotation, it's the worst rotation to have, and basically what happens is when you're in the hot seat, or when I'm in the hot seat, what I do is I set my cell phone alarm for like 6 a.m., 6.15 a.m., 6.30, 6.45, and if my cell phone goes off, and I look to check if seeing Donald Trump has tweeted, and if he hasn't, I roll back over and I sleep until the next one. <laughs> Little Kate 
Turner or Sarah Murray, and this is what a Donald Trump rally is like, and it's just not like, you know, what I covered, like, sweet Jeb Bush, or like, <laughs> <laughs> it's a very different dynamic. <laughs> Let me, uh, Colin, you talked about the sort of narcissism that this creates. Uh, that was a half of our news conference yesterday, where Stephen Miller, essentially, it was Stephen Miller, uh, Jim Acosta, and Glenn Frush. Um, talk about how that came down and how that moment fits into your analysis here, and what you felt you were doing, and what is your obligation here, because you do have to ask tough questions of this White House, particularly when they say things that aren't true. Yeah. And yet, in doing so, you create the very dynamic that you were describing. I'd like you to sort of analyze that using yesterday as a good example, I think. Well, let me just, uh, before that, let me take you back on Ashley's name as well. Ashley covered uh, the, the, the Trump campaign pretty much, not from start to finish, but there were uh, a lot of it. I'm, I'm a relative newbie. I've been at the time for seven months. I've been covering Trump full time for seven months. Before that, I was covering the next president of the United States, Hillary Rodham Clinton. <laughs> um, and I was expecting, you know, I don't think it would have been, would have been a hot seat. It was a, oh, a slightly warm seat. <laughs> um, I, I think, when you go into these press conferences, first of all, the, the briefing room, for those of you who haven't been there, is very small. It, it looks much larger on TV. Actually, it's smaller, it's, much smaller than this room. Oh, way yeah. smaller. Yeah. Would you say five, or six of them could be into this room? Um, and the front row is going to the TV guys. And uh, the TV guys, I mean, just no disrespect to my, my brethren on the broadcast, uh, but they preen. That's what they get paid to do. <laughs> <laughs> they get paid. They get paid to have to have the camera on them while they're asking the tough question, <clears throat> and then the answer is sometimes secondary. Right. I mean, it's just the nature of the game. Most of them are extraordinarily good at what they do and very good at eliciting my answers. But print and broadcast have obviously different functions. Um, the thing about these guys, covering these guys, um, is that they don't even bother giving you false statistics most of the time. When you go, when you would go and cover new policy, in this range from the Bush administration, and I also cover City Hall in New York, um, people would at least have the fig leaf of handing you a fact sheet. <laughs> we are about to completely radically overhaul X policy, and in order to bolster that, here are five studies. And a lot of, a lot of times they're Fakakta studies <laughs> that are clearly angled towards their a certain conclusion. Um, but these guys don't even bother doing that. I remember, you know, I don't know if you, you, you remember this, but when the president unveiled the outline of his tax policy, it was a one, it was a single page, double spaced, uh, and big type. No, and here's, here's the best part. They've only printed out half, half enough to hand out to everybody. It was a period of So not only was there nothing on it, but people were fighting each other. <laughs> Perfect, I think, is a great metaphor for covering the whole, whole damn thing. Um, but I think uh, Stephen Miller is somebody, is a fascinating, fascinating, uh, one of those fascinating, fascinating, boring people that Washington produced. <laughs> He's a, he's a former Senate staffer and a real ideologue on immigration, and he believes, and I, I will use the term belief because it is, it is an article to him, you know, that uh, immigration, both illegal and legal, suppresses wages uh, for among working class folks, uh, native born Americans. Um, there's a lot of evidence to the contrary of that. There's been no firm causal link established. He's standing up there articulating a policy which is controversial inside the administration of cracking down on legal immigration um, through various means by which uh, they have been very specific. What I was trying to do in that, uh, in that uh, briefing room was with my relatively limited knowledge of the subject area, get him to give me a number. Tell me how many Americans have lost their jobs or give me a statistical benchmark on how wages have been reduced because of the policy that you are looking to change. If you've got to try to change something radically, if you're going to change the immigration status of millions of Americans, tell us why you're doing it. And in the course of my asking that question, he delivers speech, which, by the way, politicians do. Uh, and it is my obligation to tell him, no, I don't want to hear your speech. I've heard your speech before 7,000 times. I want to give you statistical uh, data. And so his role then 
and he was very good at this, very good at this. He was, a, he was an excellent debater at Duke University, that was his, his training, was uh, to attempt to, to parse my words and turn me into a debate opponent. What you're watching there is Stephen Miller trying to turn me into a political opponent and me trying to get information out of him. And I think uh, that was why it, it got sort of contentious. But the one thing I realized halfway through the exchange was it was becoming a little bit too much of, about me and Steve, and I kind of pulled off at that point and didn't cross the over. <laughs> <laughs> you need a good politician if you're carefully parsed how you just answered that um, question. Let me ask you, um, I want to ask something. We will get to the audience, by the way, as early, quite early in this, but uh, there are a few things I want to just sort of lay out for us. Russia and how that is handled inside the White House. There are typically damage containment teams, and this so often looks like the operation of a damage enhancement team. <laughs> um, and in particular, um, uh, how they seem to act guilty even as they insist that they're not, uh, yet they seem to have some strategy <coughs> about playing to someone out there. Uh, and you heard it again last night with uh, Trump's speech in West Virginia where he's really trying to say that this whole scandal is trying to rob his people of the victory that they had. Can you talk about what it is like in that press room and in the White House dealing with the Russia story, um, and what it's like also to be in there while our reporters over here are you know, producing you know, all this damaging information? I mean, I, I do think the Trump administration is correct that, like, the average voter, and certainly their average voter, is not does not really care about the Russia investigation. It's just not what animates people if you travel the country and talk to them. Um, but I do like so. I have no, you know, I'm not Bob Mueller, right? Like I don't actually know if the Trump campaign colluded during the campaign. Um, but I do think what's more damaging than what they may or may not have done are all of the actions they've taken that looks like they're trying to cover it up. And the person who is doing the most whatever anti-damage containment, as you put it, is the president himself. And so normally you hire lawyers to, to like protect you. Um, and he has hired a legal team who he flouts, he ignores. You know, there was one time that we reported his legal team met with him and was like, basically, like, whatever you do, just don't mention X. And they have literally left the White House and they work back at their law offices and he speaks about X, right? Um, so he just can't help himself. And I think, and nobody can understand it. It seems confounding, right? Like, if you really did nothing wrong, why not just let this investigation play out? And I think, and you spoke about this too, but I think the reason he is so obsessed with this, and now also he's upset because he's getting into his family's finances and his business dealings and his pulling in the people he loves. But the reason is like he sees the, the Russia issue as an assault on his legitimacy as, as the president. And it gets at like his key insecurity, which is that like he didn't deserve this, that everything he's achieved, you know, he's still not taken seriously. He's a kid from Queens, and even when he makes a lot of money, it's kind of like gouge and it's not, not old money or it's crude money and crass money, and then he finally gets elected to the presidency and he doesn't win the popular vote and he thinks like people want to take it away from him and that I think is why he's so obsessed and so strong about Russia and like self managing. Glenn, just on that, do you think he he seems to have a particular fear of this investigation extending beyond the Russia, especially if it goes down a financial road? Do you have a thought on what their thinking is about all of this? The one thing that the larger context of this is what I set out to cover American politics, not Donald Trump. The absolute, all-encompassing, blanket nature of covering this guy that you just drag him into thinking about him all the time. And, and if you kind of look at the, for the lowest common denominator, everything that he does or says is about focusing attention on himself. And for those of you, if any of you have had like uh, kids, for instance, <laughs> if you're familiar with this phenomenon, and it doesn't necessarily put you in a best mood every single day. So I, I mean, so part of the rational, part of the justification is just the you know the, the massive deal that we are trying to, to chase every single day. Um, and what was the question? Just oh. <laughs> <laughs> a question about where they fear this is going. I, I just the financial stuff is extremely. We don't know what we don't know, and we don't know if he knows what we don't know. And, and I think the main thing is he is basically a salesman. 
if anybody, I'm from New York. I have been around Donald Trump my entire life. I have my in-laws grew up in Trump Village in Brighton Beach, Brooklyn. Um, I've been covering him more or less as anyone. Um, I come from New York City tabloids. And, you know, before he became a presidential candidate, I last two interactions with him, by the way, were not answering phone messages from him when he was talking to his uh, West Side project. That was Donald Trump. He's a real estate salesman. He's a real estate salesman to rich people. He's a real estate salesman to nouveau rich people. So that's all about selling and aspiration. So fact and reality, particularly fact and financial reality, are things that he doesn't necessarily want out there. So in addition to sort of the psychic component of this, when you start getting into money with Donald Trump, specific dollar amounts, you are in real trouble. He went to war against Bloomberg, and with the Wall Street Journal, it was a business week during the campaign, when they were downgrading his wealth. People forget that that was one of the big uh, fights that he had initially. And then part of his, uh, uh, I think, lack of disclosure in terms of his uh, income tax return has not necessarily to do with where the source of his money is, but how much of it he actually has. So in terms of legitimacy, to Ashley's point, this is a man who has defined for most of his life legitimacy by how much money he's made. So this gets to the very core of his legitimacy or illegitimacy. Um, you know, we just uh, have the seeds today at this table of a new conspiracy. Glenn Thrush grew up in Trump Village. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so technically now, technically, I grew uh, my parents owned an ice cream, a Carvel ice cream store, located a quarter of a mile from Trump Village. Yeah. Uh, that's <laughs> close enough. See, we can catch up with that. Great, we can do a novel on this. Um, I, I, I sort of do have, even though I know a lot of, not everybody in this room is in show market, not everybody in this room is here year round, but I do have a sense of the politics of the room. I, <laughs> just so you know, the vote in Chilmar in 2016 was Clinton came 617, Donald Trump, the Trump and Pence, 94. So we do know where this is coming from, but I think a lot of people have this question, and I think personally it's a legit question, which is the whole question about false balance during this campaign, and how you guys looking back on how the campaign uh, was covered, um, the, it, everything we're seeing from Donald Trump really, in some sense, uh, everything except his victory was quite predictable. This is not a different Trump than we saw in the campaign. And I at least think there is a question that we have, we in journalism have to answer on, on the opinion side, um, is uh, this, well, one set of sins were not like the other. Uh, and yet, um, a lot of times, this desire for balance forced the coverage to say, well, he does this bad and she does that bad, and that, and therefore uh, it's equivalent. I, I just heard recently from someone who's talking about a TV person whose job was to find stuff on Clinton so they could look balanced, and it was a lot harder to find this stuff on her. Can you talk about this whole question of false balance and what responsibility does the media have about it, but in particular, because I think the newspapers did a better job on this, and not just because of my own bias. How much responsibility does television have, given all of the free coverage that Donald Trump did? I mean, he's the only guy ever who could do Meet the Press and This Week and Face a Nation in his pajamas. That had not been permitted uh, before. He could do it on the phone. He insists he never did it in his pajamas. So just talk about the campaign, because I think a lot of people, at some point, somebody was going to ask about that. And I think it's a fair set of questions. Uh, this is slightly different, but like I, as somebody who covered Trump, I really didn't have much dealing with the Democrats. Like the existentially troubling thing I found was it often just feel, felt like we're in the nothing matters election. And so typically when you cover candidates, you cover politics. If you write that, well, two things. One is Trump and his team would just blatantly lie, right? It wasn't even the cute Clintonian line, right? Like depending on what the meaning of the word is. is. It was just like straight up lies. Um, so that was one thing that I think journalists kind of had to grapple with, that it wasn't just a creative twisting of the facts. It was just fact-free information. But normally if you're covering a candidate and you- Fact-free, that's a great phrase. <laughs> but if you're, if you're covering a candidate, typically, um, you know, and you fact-check a candidate, like I'm covering Jeb Bush, and he, um, he's saying, you know, Florida was number one in job creation for three years in a row, and you do a story saying, like, well, that's not quite true. They were number one in job creation one year, but then Texas surpassed them. You often see a campaign react to that, and the candidate either takes that line out of their speech or they tweak it to be accurate. And it's not because 
they care about what we, the media, thinks, so, but because they believe there's a social penalty if the media calls them out for lying or being incorrect or being crude, and then they're changing it because they don't want to pay that social penalty with the voters. And what was interesting about Trump, and, and I'm not saying the coverage was perfect at all, but I would argue some of the coverage was a lot better and tougher, especially once we became a real candidate than people give us credit for, but it was just that it simply did not matter, right? You could write that Trump said this, or he did that, or he's lying about this, or this is simply not true, and voters just did not care. Um, and again, you're not writing to change voters' minds one way or the other, you're sort of writing to tell the truth as you best know it in that moment, but it was just a striking departure that I have never seen before in, in covering politics. Um, he was just sort of like impervious to, you know, facts. <laughs> I always want you to go back, thank you, and that was very good. And I, I want you to go back to your arch opinionated self uh, that used to write those five, uh, those lists of five for Politico, and go look back on the campaign and, and sort of how you just like exactly what Ashley said. Also, uh, uh, just a, an ancillary question. I've always thought that Trump profited immensely from the thing he always complained about, which is nobody thought he could win. And the fact that nobody thought he could win meant, among other things, I think, that the investigative work got delayed. It was big, there was a lot of it eventually, and Trump is the only candidate in history who fended off one scandal with another scandal. Uh, and it was really remarkable. But could you sort of, I'd like you to take sort of two, three steps, five steps back from the campaign, sort of how you thought about it. Yeah, right. No, I don't injure anything else. Oh, yeah. um, look, well, back to your, uh, well, first of all, this, this is the first president, I believe, in history who has lied about talking to the head of the Boy Scouts. <laughs> I gotta say, that's we have an omelet here. That's a new one. Come up with that one, guys. Um, back to your original question about kind of how we cover the campaigns. I think I can answer that one with that one. Um, uh, the problem is, it doesn't matter how we cover the campaign, <laughs> to some extent, because we now have a cohort of this country that's paying attention to, to what we do as kind of mainstream media. We've been fed uh, an entire line, and we've had 30 years of this of being channeled towards an essentially propagandistic media. Right. I'm sorry, there's not an equivalence between mainstream media, which is consumed, I think, overall by the progressives, and what's going on on the right. We can't play that game anymore. Fox and Friends is not the equivalent of CNN on its very best day, right? Um, even if what's hijacked CNN. I, I think, and, and that is the fundamental problem, we're talking to people who want to listen. So we are continuing do our job the way generally they've done our job, collect the facts, uh, hold, attempts to hold people accountable, and you have a, a group of people with Trump and, <coughs> and the supporters who are not playing by that same set of rules. They're, they're playing, you know, we're playing baseball and they're playing uh, football. Um, the other thing I think that that's, that's sort of important to note um, is that I think the president uh, has created an environment, and my colleague, Maggie Abraham wants this, this term, a gaslight, based on the Hitchcock, uh, the Hitchcock film, of creating a centrally alternative reality that, that they get people to buy into. So you have somebody, you have a group of people that you have, I think it's, what is it, 63, what is it, 63% of uh, Republican voters believe that, uh, that, that, that the president uh, and his death have no contact with the Russians at all. People have opinions about fact, think about that. We are, we are now operating in an environment where we have a large segment of the electorate, the one that has the president elected, who have opinions about whether or not verifiable fact is true. That is an incredibly dangerous situation. So I think that's what's changed the entire game. We're continuing ahead in the Teddy White mold. Like, this is the way, this is the continuum of history, which is rolling along this river towards a larger progress, we have taken a, this river has gone <laughs> over the banks, and we are in an entirely different uh, environment now. I want, I want to press both of you on this, because it, or, and right at the beginning, we started with your point about Trump wanting to make the media part of the narcissistic game. But you really have, um, you, you often have battles between 
lighthouses in journals. And there have always been lighthouses that didn't want certain information out. I don't think we have ever had, or at least uh, not in, I, I, I can't think of it from maybe certain points of the early republic, but that's when all the press was partisan. Uh, a real wholesale war by the government, by the administration against mainstream media, which means how do you avoid the problem of confrontation? Uh, because they, they, their policy, their very attitude toward news, toward facts, makes, they, makes it a confrontation between the institutions. How do you guys deal with that, Ashley? Um, I mean, I, so I should say this is also the first White House I've ever covered. Um, so I know the difference. Um, no. But, you know, I'm, I'm used to like an inherently antagonistic relationship between the people I cover and, and the media. That's not that different. Uh, I mean, the one thing, this is sort of the opposite point, but the one thing that is interesting in terms of their relationship with the media, for as antagonistic as it is, and, you know, Sessions just declared war on the media and elites, and I think we've never seen that before, but in a weird way, this is one of the most open and accessible administrations we've ever covered for a, for a couple of reasons. So one is that when the president tweets, we know exactly what that man is thinking in that moment, right? It's not strategy or like, you know, Chuck Schumer political chess. It's like Donald Trump feels something and he can't contain it any longer and he puts it in a <laughs> And so he's the first president we know what he's thinking in real time. Um, he's also, and again, I didn't cover Obama, but I had a good enough sense of it. If you wanted to get an interview with Obama or even get any FaceTime with him or if Hillary had been president or George Shelby Bush before that, you would go through their press people and there would be layers of negotiations and interviews and you would come in at an appointed time and there would be press aides sitting in and you would, you know, you would have 15 minutes and they would kick you out after 15 minutes and this has happened to me. I know this is happening when you're in the West Wing for a meeting and someone says like, oh hey, do you want to like wander into the Oval Office to say hi to the president? And you're kind of like, sure. Um, but, but that does, to be clear, that does not happen in any other administration. Um, and then the final thing is this White House, because especially television media, but also print newspapers, and also print newspapers drive us on television, so it's all this weird ecosystem. His aides, and maybe this will change under General Kelly, but like, they also need us in this weird way, and so all of these factions, instead of, even Ivanka, sometimes when she wants to make a point to her father, like, she'll get someone to write a letter to the newspaper, or Bannon wants a point of view across, or Kellyanne, or those factions, or whatever, They'll use the newspaper or the TV reporter to get it in front of the president instead of making that pitch in a meeting. So we're often hearing what all of these competing and warring factions are thinking all of the time. <laughs> it's, it's like a family that's like removed the facade of their house so you can watch them. <laughs> <laughs> So, 
of competition, people are really building with each other. Every afternoon, you'll hear everybody cussing. You know, there's something will pop at 5 o'clock and be like, that story is full. And then all the tenants say, well, that story isn't full. <laughs> <laughs> but we just came up with this. So it is a lot of fun being in the newsroom, just like for those of us who work till 3 o'clock in the morning in our school newspapers, which is how we all got into this crazy thing. Um, it's just a, it's an incredibly cool thing. But I think the competition thus far is, is sort of, uh, is, is, uh, is bringing out the best. I think all the stuff, uh, I think the higher you get, the higher you get on the mass that, I think the more intense the competition is. I think reporters, we do compete every day with one another. But I think in general, we all know where the winning. And I, I just make that up for a better question. Actually, by the way, I want to open it. I'm going to ask one more question about Kelly. <coughs> Uh, but I, I think there are mics that are going to go through the room. Um, if we could just get that uh, process begun, or some of you let me know how that's going, so we can start with you guys. Um, but as we, the competition, the uh, Celtics, the Lakers, Red Sox game, what's this? Uh, yeah, I mean, they're just, like, I think it feels invigorating, right? Like, it often just feels like a tennis match with, like, like you're just watching the ball go back and forth on Twitter, and we often say, like, in our newsroom, like, it's scoop o'clock, right? Because it means, it, you know, like... Is that five? It's like, it's like 6 p.m. on a Friday when, like, all you want to do is go home. And, like, either your competition has some amazing story or your colleagues have some amazing story. Yeah, just like after a political one, but as somebody who's working for a political one, I'm going to have a political one. Yeah, Politico has some great story. Um, and exactly what Glenn said, like, that, you know, there was a period, and we're all, I think we're all very aware of what everyone in the competition is Doing, right? I mean, Mike Schmidt, there was a period that he had a week, we worked with the Times, we broke a number of those great Kobe stories. And I can remember sitting in the Post newsroom and like some story breaks and everyone's like reading it to take it in and then I can be like, it's Schmidt again, it's Schmidt again. <laughs> Right. 
emojis. <laughs> Over and over again. So when you are 
it was one of the interesting things about Kelly, uh, Kelly being picked. Kelly is part of a group of five or six people who are the grown-ups in that administration. So his pool of talent that he's choosing from, which gets smaller and smaller, uh, is ever shrinking. And uh, the mooch came. <laughs> Could I ask one quick question, Ashley? What, how did Rebus survive so long? Uh, is another way to put it. Is this just an astonishingly bad fit? And what can I yeah. talk about you? I mean, I, I think at the end of the day, Rebus made just a personal goal that he his his goal was not to advance Republican health care legislation, and his goal was not to make the president look good. Like at the end of the day, at some point, there was a turning point. I believe where his goal was just to last a year, or just to be the last man standing. And I will say, Glenn was mentioning all these competing factions, and this is a stunning White House where. Every single, not principal, but every single aide has their own PR team and their own chief of staff. And so what was striking and what the president eventually picked up on and was not particularly happy about was you could write something really negative about the president and like maybe you'd get a phone call, maybe you wouldn't. If you wrote something negative about Brian Sprevis, his PR team would go into overdrive and you would have seven people calling you and screaming at you. So we basically had a full army of RNC staffers devoted to Ryan Sprevis press. Uh, which helped him for a while. And he had an endless threshold for the humiliation of the president. <laughs> <laughs> but he just simply, for real, this could have gone on and on and on and on. Like, him being humiliated over and over by, by people in the building uh, was not a, was not any uh, any major motivation for him getting out. It had to be brought into the public before he was uh, driven out. Um, the lady over there, um, great deal, yeah, right there. I, you guys probably know who this was, but somebody said recently there are a bunch of people in the White House who are trying to save America from Trump. Does this sound familiar? I mean, somebody like Kelly or something. And so I'm sort of wondering, are there people in the White House who really understand how insane Trump is and that they need to save America from Trump? Or are they all as crazy as you? Well, I mean, they all want to, you know what I mean? I mean, I mean do these guys a huge favor with him. You know what I mean? <laughs> no, I mean, this is something I saw in the news. I mean, but, and, but, and what the more serious question is, are there, I, I mean, are there people who work for him who understand that, that there's something very dark and weird and that the dangers going on who are trying to save us from him? Or, yeah. or are they all on the same team? I, I will say there were a number of people, I think, who were able to sort of more establishment or Republican types, RNC types, who were able to sort of talk themselves into taking jobs in the administration by using the justification of being like, look, Trump would not have been my first choice, my second choice, or even my 14th choice, right? But he's the president now, and I want to get in. He's a Republican president. We have a Republican Congress. I want to get in there to help pass Republican health care, help do Republican tax reform, and help do these things. And he may be an imperfect messenger, and that's why I would have chosen. But, but that's what I want to do. And you do have a lot of sort of traditional Republican types in that administration. And you have some who true believers. It's a mix. Yeah, I, think, I think you have, well, first of all, you have the Gary Fallon and Dean Powell cluster, which is pretty good and a much more mainstream view of, of Republican, Republicanism and the Republican Democrat. Um, look, the White House is really powerful still. We have to value this to the point where it's not an incredibly powerful institution. And people who want to get things done are still headed to the White House. The other thing that I would say that I think you should, folks should keep their eye on is this. Where Trump's interests align with the Koch brothers' uh, lean of the party, the deregulatory lean of the party, that is where stuff is getting done. Because that, that is the schism that most hurts Trump. And it's interesting that probably the one, the most effective White House aide whose name you don't know, Mark Short, his legislative director is a former Koch brothers uh, staff. And so does that mean that the Republicans stay on side for a good long time? Because the last week, you've seen a little bit more of a kind of breakup of Republican solidarity. I mean, it seems once they went after a former Republican senator, i.e. Jeff Sessions, somehow or other that was the end of the line, not insulting McCain or any of the other stuff. But it, something seems to have happened, and yet, I, I'm glad you underscored that, because there is a lot more policy overlap between Trump and very traditional Republicanism than his rhetoric suggests he wants to let on. What, where is the break? feared 
through his Twitter feed or fear the wrath of the president. Um, and I think to some extent that's true in some of these House districts, and that's why you're not seeing a ton of profiles in courage. But I also think if you look in Congress, and you especially look on the Senate side, like these people don't respect him and they don't fear him. And again, nobody is going to vote for a health care bill that they think is bad um, just because they do or don't like the president. But I do think it has made it a lot harder for him to exercise like the levers of power and the, the levers of the presidency when like people don't care if he, he says something negative or his secretary of the interior calls you up and, and threatens your state, right? Like they, they just don't care and they're gonna do what they think is right for their constituents. Yeah, the Senate's a big problem for him. The House is, is easier. But the bottom line is Donald Trump represents the primal uh, sort of the primal issues of the Republican base better than any politician in America. Donald Trump is just, is really the, the, the national politician, the only national public politician who's been able to sort of capitalize on a Tea Party energy. So the truth of the matter is, regardless of what he does, he still owns that real estate, and there's nothing that any of the senators can do about that. Funny you use the real estate metaphor. Can we get some rights into the middle is being discriminated against? That's the case here. So I just get a couple. Why don't we? Why don't you pass it? Well, let's get two questions at once because this is a crowd at once. So why don't you pass it right back to you? I'll get to you at, uh, next round. Go ahead. When Mueller doesn't work. See you in the mic. Or it's not. Yeah. Underneath. Or just speak really loud. Mueller does his work, he has some action and it's adverse to Trump and his family. What do you expect to be the response from Trump and what do you expect to be the response from Congress? All right, hold on. Let's, and then the lady right, or yeah, right. I don't know. Oh, yeah, this word. Um, I assume that, and I hope that most reporters um, use reliable sources, right? And you've mentioned trying to make sure your sources are reliable. So what I don't understand is if all of these briefings are full of lies and non-facts, why do you keep going to the briefings? <laughs> is it inconceivable to just ignore them and not show up? Uh, two completely diverse questions. Uh, I'll, I'll, actually, I'll let Ashley take the one she wants and stick you to the other one. <laughs> I'll take the second one. Uh, <laughs> Oh, 
Oh, you know, let's, can I be a, oh, oh, go ahead. I, I want to save you from steps. I should have gone with you in the back. Oh, there, so. yeah, Well, I thought I got them both. The Mueller and, and the Westbrook. Yeah, you did. Yeah. 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 Well, nobody, in the answer to the question, nobody fully knows, so we were just sort of trying to ask. Right? Thank you. 
new on infrastructure, they can't get anything done because the politics would be crazy. Um, do we, let me take one up front here. By the way, there's a brilliant Wall Street Journal reporter here. Does he care to join us? Or he could pass if he wants. He has to do a great <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And then let's get a mic to this gentleman since I think he sees him. Where, where are you? Oh, okay, okay, well, you go, and then to me, this man has been waving for a long time. All right, then let's get it. Yeah, right. Thank you. All right, I'm just wondering if I could get both Ashley and Glenn uh, to hone in a little bit more on uh, what they perceive as the dangers. Uh, I, I don't think it's any accident that Glenn uh, left us with this image that he wakes up to, which is being a fighter pilot in the Battle of Britain. And we know what that fight was about, so let's put it in not inconceivable terms. I mean, is there a totalitarian streak? Is the president do you fear an authoritarian streak? I mean, what is, if you would, both, the, you know, tell us the, uh, the, you know, at some point, you put all of these dots together and you began to feel some real danger. What is that danger? I'm going to cheat here. We have a whole chapter in our book on that very question. It's a really important question. Let me get that gentleman in and then you can answer the public. Media can spend years delegitimizing the mainstream media, and so now when 
we suddenly want the mainstream yeah. media to fact check the president and hold him accountable. We've trained our voters not to care. Thank you. We've got two questions to uh, this gentleman and that gentleman. I'm sorry for everybody else who couldn't get in. Um, sir. Thank you. Yeah, my uh, question actually relates to the last point you made. I think that candidate Trump actually got off very easy during the debates. And perhaps that was because no one thought he could actually win, but he hardly sustained secondary and tertiary questions. Um, and I think that if he's able to survive this term and gets to this 2020 election, I can't imagine, and given what we know now about everything that's happened and potentially the lack of accomplishments, I can't imagine him squirming out of the debates, but maybe I'm being too optimistic. And I wonder if there's any role that print journalists have in really, you know, causing a little bit more severe um, uh, requirements in terms of that in those most of days. Uh, thank you, and sir, right there. But, oh, who was, yeah. Uh, the gorilla in the room. Uh, Ashley, you just returned from Texas offshore. Uh, True? Yeah. Yeah. Um, what we miss, um, it seems, since uh, there's so much Trump haze, is how this looks offshore. You know, so it's up at 3 o'clock in the morning listening to BBC trying to get a perspective. Um, how, did, how does this affect us offshore? We, and, did we get, and, and particularly, the drumbeat of we haven't had an incident so far, and God help us if we have one, onshore or offshore, with, say, uh, North Korea launching an ICBM that's capable of getting us far. Uh, how does that look when you're offshore, say, with Thank you. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, I think our allies are, are quite worried. Um, that's a lot of what Pence's trips abroad are, are reassuring allies that whatever, we support Article 5 of NATO, or we will be with them, you know, against Russian aggression uh, in the region. And he's, it's a really strong, enforceable message. The only problem is the president back home is tweeting and saying the exact opposite. Um, and so I think these countries, if they're most optimistic, want to believe what the vice president is saying, but but they're nervous. Um, and one funny thing just about these countries in general is nobody knows what to make of this. And so I, I'm sure Glenn has had the same thing, but I've had a number of diplomats email me and my colleague Phil Rucker and say, you know, these embassies, can you get breakfast? And it's like, it's like of course. What, what great documents do you have to slip to us when we show up for breakfast or coffee? And these people are like, so what did it mean when Trump tweeted that about me just space? <laughs> right? And like, they're literally getting frantic phone calls from their leaders and their people back in their country, and like they just don't know what to say about it. And it's like, like can you can you be a Trump whisperer? Can you tell us what to tell you know? Um, so I think there's like a lot of confusion, and they are sort of struggling to, to make sense of this election the way you know other other people. Yeah, they're cornering us in Q20 left.
right before the St. Louis debate, when Trump uh, and Steve Bannon staged this uh, Facebook Live event with six women, came right out after the access Hollywood, and I said, we're going to, we're plumbing a depth I've never seen before, and no one's gonna go for this. And what did Trump campaign people tell you? That was the turning point of the campaign. And on that, I, I, I'm going to try to end on an uplifting <laughs> note. So, uh, um, I just want, I have a favorite, uh, one of my favorite Bob 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 quotes. Uh, he said, when a truth is not given complete freedom, freedom is not complete. And so, and the search for truth is difficult. The media sometimes have trouble finding it or even seeing it. But I want to thank Glenn and Ashley and all our colleagues who are trying to help us find it. And I think all of you